Let's call this rowdy group of people to, to, uh, together. All right, so the next session um, is non-rodent animal models for microbiome research, the model organisms. We have C. elegans, Drosophila, zebrafish, and piglets. The piglets will come from afar by video here in the form of Jeff Gordon. And our first speaker is uh, Buck Samuel on C. elegans. Take it away. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Is that? No. No? It's supposedly working. Is that better? Yeah? OK. Um, I'm going to try this, uh, this lapel mic here. Hopefully, that works a little bit better uh, for the speakers. I really appreciate the opportunity from the organizers here to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, really the, mostly the promise for this uh, not new model organism, but new to notobiotics. Uh, model organism C. elegans uh, that developed in uh, my, new, my new lab at uh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine, the Center for Metagenomics and, and, and Microbiome uh, Research uh, today. And I, and I really uh, like to start with this, uh, this picture here. Um, it's a, a picture of uh, a SEM of, of human feces here, but I, uh, as I think it really tantalizes about a lot of the interactions that we uh, imagine that are going on, if only we could see um, and appreciate uh, within, uh, within the human gut, these collaborations, these competitions between microbes for, uh, for nutrients and how they bid for space within uh, a very complicated um, ecosystem of, uh, of the human gut. Um, but I also like this slide because I really feel like it could be in any gut. Um, it, could be, it could be anywhere. And sort of these interactions uh, between microbes and the metabolites uh, that they uh, secrete to uh, uh, mediate host influence uh, could really be happening in any, any number of animals. Uh, and I'd like you to think about yourselves as, a little bit of, uh, as having a little bit of worms still in you, just as Nietzsche uh, would have suggested. <laughs> Slightly out of context, of course, but uh, um, but the idea uh, I, I think is, is is there. And perhaps this election season, you may have seen people that are more worm than human, and uh, <laughs> as well. But uh, but that's a different talk um, here. What I'd like to hopefully convince you today is that that C. elegans. In uh, the main takeaway, I'd like uh, you to see uh, in the promise of this organism is that. Much of what C. elegans can offer is in, at the level of throughput and a really a host system that is uh, poised for notobiotic, uh, notobiotic research. And as, as um, we all here are re recognizing, we, we have no shortage of correlations in microbiome research. Of one microbe associating with, uh, with states of health uh, or disease, the challenge is being able to uh, sort cause from effect, changes in environment uh, of the gut, for example, uh, relating to a bloom and abundance for, uh, of that particular microbe versus that microbe driving a particular disease. And the underlying assumption that, and the reason why I uh, moved from notobiotic mice to notobiotic C. elegans is to address the throughput gap. The underlying premise being that if we could only test all those microbes, if we could only test all the conditions, we could better understand this process of what um, makes us, uh, what helps us to, um, to transition from a healthy state to, uh, to a diseased state. And I think that, so there's, uh, so the part of um, the, the worm that is still in us um, is, and the utility in this, in answering these questions, is evidence, as I highlight here, by some of the discoveries um, that C. elegans helped um, all of biology um, to, uh, to identify, uh, one of those being the genetic control of, of behavior, the genetic control of lifespan. It used to be a death by a thousand cuts. We know there's a genetically ordered process now. RNAi, microRNAs were discovered in C. elegans, and a host of others um, that here weren't discovered in, first in C. elegans, but has certainly contributed to our understanding of, uh, of these processes um, as well. So, so that's the part of the worm uh, that's within us. Um, and 
we really think that by leveraging the power of C. elegans from a genetic perspective, that we can hopefully use that to understand how microbes are mediating any number of influence on, um, on host health. So today I'm going to tell you, uh, my talk is, is uh, loosely organized into uh, three sections. Uh, one sort of emphasizing uh, more about C. elegans itself for those uninitiated. Um, its influence of its natural microbiome, which uh, we and uh, two other groups uh, described this year, and also uh, uh, ending with uh, some tantalizing potential for its application to, uh, to human systems. And so what, what I'd like to, uh, to emphasize uh, straight out is that C. elegans has a very robust notobiotics uh, toolbox. So it has, it's really easy to make germ-free. You just need some bleach and some uh, uh, so, uh, uh, sodium hydroxide. Um, and it's, it's quite horrific. The, the animals are, are, are the mothers are um, dissolved away, leaving the eggs left that are just nice and sterile. Um, and in this way, every experiment can start as a germ-free experiment. You can take the, the two million uh, isolates, uh, um, two million mutants that are present in our uh, collections, and you can make any one of those germ-free without having to raise them in their, own, in their own isolators. And you can give them any number of, uh, of, of microbes. And already, because of the utility of the system, there are a, a multitude of robust and high throughput uh, assays that uh, you can look at to look at the impact of microbes on metabolism, lifespan, stress, immunity, you name it. Um, there's probably uh, already an assay that um, can help you uh, to, uh, to look at that question. And, and, and then also, as I'll get to a little bit later, it has a, a defined um, natural microbiome that, uh, that it is responsive to. The biggest benefit, or one of the biggest benefits of, uh, of C. elegans is that no animal protocol. They don't even count these as animals. Um, in, uh, as far as the uh, IRB or uh, IACAC, any of that, um, no paperwork uh, for C. elegans, which I appreciate. Uh, so, um, which I which, you know, is an underappreciated uh, uh, aspect of doing research in this area. It also is, uh, has a very short lifespan, about two, a little over two weeks, and most experiments you can do in three days. Uh, that will take you from egg to uh, young adulthood, and you can get um, a response. It also has, uh, was one of the uh, first or organisms to have its complete cell lineage and body plan uh, mapped. It has 959 cells. You know where each one is at any point in development. Um, and this facilitates really the systems level's perspective. Um, and also is, uh, is, is transparent, and which allows for um, imaging uh, of both um, hosts and microbes. Um, so in just to, again, sort of emphasize the throughput of the system, uh, you can uh, routinely, with one person, uh, do 20,000 microbiome uh, different combinations or different microbes in about um, three to six months of work, depending on the robustness of your assay. So throughput is, 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 the, main, is the main benefit um, here. So of these 959 cells, 300 of them are, uh, are neurons um, here that make up uh, the sort of nervous system of, uh, of C. elegans. And 20 of those um, cells, which make up more than half of the, the worm's area um, and volume, are intestinal cells. Uh, and it, like in other systems, is the main point of contact with, um, with the microbes. And uh, a, there's a, already decades of research using uh, C. elegans as a model for uh, human pathogen um, research. There's a great understanding of how C. elegans responds to Pseudomonas aeruginosa or, or Staph aureus or any number of, uh, of human pathogens. So a lot is known about its um, innate epithelial immunity, uh, also the same, um, it being a multicellular um, organism with different tissues, it has an endocrine, uh, um, me means for endocrine regulation of its metabolism, including insulin and a host of other um, insulin-like peptides and the like. Um, important for the microbiome as well, it, it, within its intestine, though it may be short um, and not a lot of too much real estate for microbes to, to grow, it has similar intestinal niches. These brush border um, architecture itself has low oxygen um, levels, has a, a, a low uh, pH. There are mucins, things for the microbes uh, to, to grow on. There's also many antimicrobials that are, uh, are produced, um, and um, things that you would expect to see in the gut are, um, are, are there as well. 
So addressing some of the challenges ahead, uh, there are, uh, as again, as C. elegans being a uh, well-studied organism, one of the forgotten areas, uh, which includes its microbiome, um, is the intestinal lumen itself. Um, so we're trying to develop uh, functional assays for, uh, for bringing the throughput uh, to genome-wide scale for assays of digestive intestinal function, um, also being able to look at and do live imaging of uh, microbiome function in the actual animal itself and being able to dissect those um, interaction pathways. On the host side of things, there are already a robust uh, series of platforms for uh, systems biology of um, C. elegans. You can map, as I said, every one of the 959 cells, they know where it is, and you, there are um, uh, computational models that can uh, paint those cells um, with any number of omics data, data sets throughout uh, development. This is an example of um, a project called OpenWorm. Uh, that is focused on the nervous system here, and it's 302 neurons here highlighted. So there's a lot of potential for, uh, for interfacing a microbiome uh, uh, and, and analyses on the bacterial side uh, with, um, with this robust um, host for really a systems level perspective. So, um, and then the last little bit um, here. Uh, uh, or the last half of my talk, I'd like to talk mostly about the, what we now know about the natural microbiome uh, of um, C. elegans um, as well. Uh, and spoiler alert, it does have a natural microbiome um, if you just know where to look. And for a number of years, uh, we didn't know where to look. Uh, we thought that C. elegans was a soil nematode. Um, turns out it's not. If you look there and you look everywhere um, in the world, um, really, uh, there was money involved. Um, people were trying to, uh, uh, to get the next sister species of C. elegans, and um, if you look in, in the soil, you, you, you don't really uh, find C. elegans. Where you, where you find them is in these rotting, rotting fruits um, here, and this is an orchard, and, or say with my uh, uh, collaborator, Moran uh, Felix, uh, goes and samples often. And so what, what, what they do exist as in the soil is uh, these stress-resistant dowers, and this is how they sort of weather the storm uh, between finding their uh, way to a, to a rotting apple, um, hitching a ride on a snail to the next, uh, to the next rotting apple. Um, so we, once we could find them, now we uh, and several other groups uh, were interested in understanding how microbes uh, were, were associating with these um, animals uh, in these environments and um, whether or not they were distinct uh, from uh, what you'd find in the rotting apple itself. So first, I uh, just want to uh, highlight the simplicity of the system. Here, uh, this is a, a, just a uh, image, wish I had an SEM to show to, uh, of, the, of this, but we'll, we'll work on that later. But you can kind of see um, bacteria, and um, what's hard to appreciate, there's also pieces of apple in here. Um, there is our fungi. Of course, there are viruses in here uh, as, as well. Um, uh, and who knows a host of host of other things? Yeah, I'll put one on right there. No, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think Vince can see it. He's got good eyes. Uh, so, um, but uh, but from a bacterial perspective, it's a very uh, very simple system of uh, five to fifteen strains of microbes. Not much real estate within the gut. Ten thousand CFUs per animal in an, in a healthy animal. Uh, so um, there there are some bottlenecks in the system there. Um, and most of the, uh, the, the highest colonization events is established in, um, in, in, in early adulthood. And so we did, we, as I mentioned, we and uh, two other groups published studies this year um, looking at um, natural C. elegans and also C. elegans uh, cultured uh, from, uh, from microcosms, basically um, compost made in the lab, uh, and um, sequenced the C. elegans uh, themselves or the, or the substrates that they came from. And you can see that um, they, they cluster distinctly uh, from their habitats. You see all the rotting apples are clustering together here. They have a similar um, alpha proteobacteria rich, acetobacteria um, rich uh, community uh, that, is, uh, that is different from what you see in, uh, in both of the natural and the lab enriched um, samples themselves. So even if uh, from a natural environment, if you expose uh, worms uh, to those natural environments, or uh, microcosms themselves, you see they pull out similar things. Um, 
And the lab enriched ones were taken for weeks and maintained in the lab. Um, and they are, uh, they are certainly losing some things, um, but they're maintaining um, a lot of that uh, microbiome as well. The reason why we never saw this in, in the whole C. elegans field before is that everybody bleaches their worms. Um, that's what we do. Uh, we get rid of all of that, uh, that uh, diversity right off the bat because it's as contamination. But we're interested in contamination now. Um, so, so who are these microbes? Uh, so uh, the, uh, you, you can, and this is a, a heat map um, across all these um, uh, 65 samples here. Uh, and you can see that the Enterobacteriaceae are, are, are common throughout. Um, here are the, as are Xanthomonaceae and Pseudomonaceae. Um, and uh, to, to a certain um, uh, extent, uh, these Bacteroides, Bacteroidetes um, down here, these Sphingobacteriaceae, Weeksaleaceae, and Labobacteriaceae um, as well. But there's also a shell of uh, more rare members that are there um, nearly 100% of the time um, as well. And this is where the sort of 5 to uh, 15 uh, number comes from. And Within this, uh, too, we have cultured isolates uh, for, um, for a lot of these. So we were um, interested in whether or not um, we could try and understand how and leverage the power of uh, C. elegans and the throughput to try and understand what these microbes are doing uh, to, uh, uh, to its um, physiology in any number of perspectives. So we have cultivated isolates um, in our collection. We have uh, 564 different microbes cultivated from um, these uh, C. elegans, natural C. elegans populations. And we can uh, create communities now that represent 80% uh, of the core um, OTUs that we find in nature. Um, and those OTUs um, are, uh, represent uh, a, a cumulative 75% um, abundance. So we still have some missing um, taxa that we were interested in, but we have definitely all of the um, all the big ones here. And what you can see um, already by uh, sort of classifying um, these microbes based on their impact on C. elegans growth and metabolism, uh, induction of a, a host of stress reporters um, here, pathogen reporters, immune reporters, uh, uh, antiviral uh, reporters um, uh, as well, uh, that there is strain level variation in the responsiveness to uh, uh, these microbes uh, to, um, or the impact of these microbes on, on the host, with only with one exception being these gluconobacteria here, here uh, which are um, acetic acid producing bacteria. All the other um, genera here uh, highlighted showed variable responses in, a, in a, quite a broad spectrum of responses um, or impacts on, on, on C. elegans uh, physiology. So we think that there's a lot of opportunity for, for really trying to delve in and understand the, the genetics of how this, how this might be occurring. And we're already starting to, and we're just at the initial stages of trying to, trying to do that. Um, and uh, this is an example here uh, of a, a small RNAi screen where we've tested uh, 364 uh, genes uh, by RNAi, so we knocked them all down in, uh, in C. elegans. Uh, most of them are involved in some um, signaling uh, capacity, nuclear hormone receptors, GPCRs, um, and the like. And they're classified in two dimensions here. One is uh, we've developed a method for high throughput uh, assessments of um, colonization here. Uh, so this gives an impact of um, an increase in colonization to the right um, versus an influence on um, on, on host health on the, um, uh, on the top. And we do this by uh, simple integration of a, a clearance of a particular bacteria um, over, over time. And we think that these may represent new signaling pathways that are used to uh, potentially regulate the microbiome's form and, um, and function. And notably, 40% of these hits uh, have direct human orthologs. So we think that we can learn more in this simple system about the basic mechanisms that hosts are using to uh, to regulate microbiome host and function. So overall, uh, I'd just like to leave you with that uh, much within the worm is still human um, as well. Uh, and we think that this ability to make it simple, uh, simply germ-free in, in any genotype, it's defined natural microbiome, and it's conserved responses 
and also uh, niches that can foster the growth of, uh, of microbes can really help facilitate what we think, at least in this organism, the complete understanding a genetic, from a genetic perspective of the microbial impact of, uh, uh, of, that microbes have on, on, on a host health. And really the holy grail is trying to uh, figure out uh, ways in which we can, of course, take this uh, disease state and somehow, uh, and by understanding the interactions as, in, the, in this disease state, to be able to push that um, back and reprogram um, more, more healthy states by understanding the pathways that are, uh, but are manipulated. So finally, I'd just like to thank uh, my uh, uh, members of my small lab uh, down at, uh, at Baylor. Um, here, uh, members of uh, the, both the Center for um, uh, Metagenomics and Microbiome uh, Research, led by uh, Joe Petrosino and, um, and Rob Britton is also uh, talking later today. Um, some great colleagues and great um, opportunities for taking uh, this uh, research and translating it into um, more uh, human-related uh, disease states as well. And with that, I'll take questions if there's time. <laughs>